Hi there. This video is titled, Aircraft Seat Belts Are Dangerous. Interesting, yes. Uh, in the early days of aviation, there were a lot of very strange concepts. And one of them, strange as it may seem, was that seat belts in aircraft were dangerous. Okay, I'll explain why. All right, now look at this early aircraft. Okay, this is the Wright Flyer's military version. And now people, they, they, they're, we're setting up right now. Okay, we, we made an evolution from laying flat on our stomach and steering, help to steer with our hip movement to actually uh, upright. But, you know, there was not a lot of standardization back then. You notice the couple of levers there? You could have different controls for different things. Some levers would control the aileron, some would control the rudder, some would control the elevator, wing warping, whatever, and it wasn't standardized at all. So you'd go one airplane to the other and you could have totally different controls. Uh, yeah, talk about challenging, but you know, it's one thing, and, and I didn't always pick up on this right away, but you notice these guys are setting out in this open structure and there's no lap belts, there's no seat belts, there's no safety harness of any sort. And look at this guy. There's no lap belt. There's no safety belt. I mean, these things go up in the air. They go high. And uh, they didn't want to have seat belts because they were considered dangerous. And I'll tell you why they were considered dangerous in just a minute. But I like old aircraft. I, I am a student of history and old aircraft. And it's funny, I do a lot of reading on this. And it's interesting some of the concepts that come along. Now, I'm kind of in a pit here, but I won't even get near this airplane unless I'm going to be fully strapped in. And I got two lap belts, okay? I got the uh, aerobatic harness. But I would, I would never get in this airplane and not be securely strapped in because there's no ceiling to keep my head from hitting. And another interesting thing is, you notice, uh, back in the day with the airliners, and this was the Junkers airliner, um, uh, the pilots wanted to be in open cockpit because they wanted to feel the wind, the slipstream and all this. And if you were enclosed, how could you feel that? How could you know what the airspeed was? How could you feel the atmosphere and stuff like that? And thank God that we got away from this. I mean, the pilots protested being put in an enclosed environment. They wanted to be able to feel. And, you know, going from, uh, you know, Chicago to Rome in an open cockpit airplane at, uh, you know, 37,000 feet would just be untenable. It would not be very comfortable at all. But this guy, well, who is this guy? This guy is Major, Major General Benjamin D. Folis. He is credited with inventing the seatbelt and a few other little things. But let me, let me tell you about this guy. Uh, he uh, learned from the Wright brothers, I guess, themselves and how to pilot. And on March 2nd, 1910, he made his first takeoff, his first solo, first landing, and first crash. Okay, well, that's quite a record on, on the very first flight. Now, uh, what he did on his second flight was he also he also, well, he didn't quite crash, but he got thrown from the airplane. And he says, I need some way of staying in this airplane. And uh, finally, by 1911, a year later, he's credited as uh, being one of the first military aviators to be uh, given the rating of military aviator. But, you know, he's a general. This is probably, probably generals always fly with instructors now. But um, military aviator, he invented multiple inventions for the right military flyer, such as aviation goggles. Yes, goggles. What an advancement. Wheels to aid in landing. You know, they use these skids, you know, uh, in, instead of uh, uh, wheels. Well, you'd, you'd come to a stop quicker, I guess, but wheels were a, a nice, ad, uh, a nice advan uh, advantage. And um, yeah, very interesting. Uh, finally, in 1926, the uh, Air Commerce Act of 1926 stipulated that seat belts or equivalent apparatus were required for pilots and passengers in open cockpit airplanes carrying passengers for hire or uh, reward. Uh, by 1928, seat belts were mandatory, mandatory on all types of aircraft, but passengers were not required to wear them. Now, I like to read about um, the early aviators, and some of the most interesting early aviators are the ones who had the most difficult time in becoming aviators. Now, if you think, you know, in the later years, it's difficult for women to advance in the field of aviation, 
Think back to uh, the 1910 uh, uh, 11 era of this whole thing. And this is Harriet Quimley. Uh, she was born May 11th, 1875, and she was an American pioneer aviator, journalist, and film screenwriter. screenwriter. In 1911, she became the first woman in the United States to receive a pilot's license. And in 1912, she was the first woman uh, to cross the English Channel. Now, here she is uh, sitting in a uh, Berlioz uh, mono, monoplane. Now, um, this, this, this aircraft, uh, or her, she became uh, pilot number 37, the Federal Aeronautic International Certificate of number 37 was issued to her by the Aero Club of America. Um, she received her pilot's license after 33 flight lessons and two test flights. Now, back in the day, a lot of what they did was they had these huge fields and they just flew level. And they flew level across the field, uh, mowing the grass back and forth and back and forth. And to actually get your pilot's license about you, all, all you had to do, uh, no VOR tracking, no under the hood or anything like this. All you had to do was you had to do a couple of turns to demonstrate you could do turns. And obviously you had to successfully do takeoffs and landings and typically have that number uh, equal each other. And then you could get a pilot's license. But it was felt that lap belts, seat belts, harnesses of any sort were dangerous uh, because on a landing uh, you could be trapped in the aircraft and you wanted the ability to jump out of the aircraft if you were having a landing accident. So they felt being strapped in was dangerous. And people flew these things around. Look at that. Here's the Berlioz flying around. Uh, you're just sitting in a wicker uh, seat in an open cockpit airplane. And okay, Here's, here's part of the problem. Now, she, uh, she obviously a uh, very beautiful woman, very well connected in that, so she could, she could afford to fly. I'll tell you about one other individual who had a little more trouble. But this is a picture of her flying uh, just before what was to become a fatal accident as a result of not having a uh, lap belt. Um, this is an actual picture just before the accident. She's in the back seat there. There was a very large person in the front seat. And, you know, there's no flight data recorder. There's no voice recorder. You don't exactly know what happened, but witnesses on the ground saw a certain movement. Now, on July 1st, 1912, she flew in the third annual Boston Air Meet in uh, Squantum, Massachusetts. And I'm sure I totally have destroyed that pronunciation. Uh, William Willard, Willard, the event organizer and father of aviator Charles Willard, who I guess you're supposed to know of that, uh, was a passenger in a brand new two-seat Berlioz monoplane. Now, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, the aircraft had very um, touchy center of gravity issues. The thing was very unstable, very hard to fly. And at an altitude of about a thousand feet, the aircraft unexpectedly pitched forward for reasons unknown. Well, uh, in in uh, the book and some other literature, I said it, it looks like the guy in the front seat who was rather uh, rotund uh, turned around and was coming backwards for some reason. Uh, uh, some people speculated he was airsick, concerned or something like that. And uh, others said that uh, he was coming back to congratulate. You know, nobody really knows because there's there's no way to record it. But the aircraft, uh, as a result of the center of gravity issue, uh, pitched forward and uh, Willard was ejected. The airplane then flipped over and Quimley was also ejected. Uh, both of them to the desks and the airplane glided down and uh, lodged itself in the mud. And of course, neither one of them was strapped in and when the aircraft went out of control, they were uh, both ejected. And in, in the book I have, this is a picture, of, she landed, um, you know, she fell a thousand feet. She hit in a muddy, swampy area uh, and uh, was killed. And here's a picture of uh, carrying uh, her out uh, of the, uh, the accident scene. Now, this young lady was uh, Elizabeth 
Coleman, otherwise known as Betsy Coleman, and um, I just had uh, I did a video on it actually uh, flying from uh, to Janesville for the uh, five hundred dollar uh, hamburger sort of thing. It was actually a five hundred dollar omelet, but um, the uh, little cafeteria there, the little restaurant, is named after her. And of course, there are places all over the world actually named after her. Uh, she was the first African American woman and the first a Native American to hold a pilot's license. Um, and she is uh, known as the earliest uh, known black person to earn an international pilot's license. Now, the interesting thing about it, uh, she tried to get uh, training here in the United States and nobody would touch her. Uh, they, uh, they were not going to give a, a black person or a woman any training, so she had to go over to France and that's where uh, she received her training. And there is a picture of her first uh, license there. And uh, oh, by the way, she was born in um, nine, uh, she was born in January 26, 1892, and she died April 30th, 1926. Now she was flying a uh, Curtis JN Jenning, which uh, is a very classic old airplane. A lot of these things were produced. But like a lot of these uh, these aircraft, um, uh, this one was not in very good condition, and um, she uh, her mechanic was flying this aircraft, twenty uh, four year old Willem Willis, and he was flying it in Dallas uh, from Dallas in preparation uh, for an air show, and uh, he. Um, actually had made three forced landings along the way because the airplane was so poorly maintained. Um, Betsy Coleman's family and friends did not want her to fly this aircraft. They were not impressed at all, but she insisted on it. Now, this is back in the time when seat belts were a bit more common, but still it was kind of a new thing and, and people weren't that enamored with him. But she was going to do a parachute jump. She was also an earlier early skydiver. And uh, uh, supposedly she was unharnessed and moving around to get a, a good look over the side to examine the terrain. Uh, about 10 minutes into the flight, uh, the plane unexpectedly went into a dive and then a spin at uh, 3,000 feet above the ground. Uh, she was ejected from the plane at 2,000 feet and was killed instantly when she hit the ground. Um, the airplane continued on down, uh, exploded, burst into flames, of course, and uh, uh, killed uh, the pilot there, um, Willis. Now, uh, they found that uh, a wrench used to service the uh, airplane had been inadvertently left in the engine area, and this caused the accident. But still, early on, you didn't need a stinking seatbelt. They just they just weren't uh, you know what you necessarily wanted. Now it's interesting. Uh, the first statewide requirement for seatbelts in cars did not come till 1961, and I remember this. I was 11 years old. We we had cars without seatbelts, uh, and then once we had seatbelts, oh, we don't need those stinking seatbelts. They were uh, they were not. Uh, uh, worn. It was not until uh, decades later that the policy went uh, nationwide that uh, cars uh, needed seat belts. And of course, this is the, your typical aircraft seat belt. Now, now, I remember when you had just a loose strap that you put in this buckle and you, you pulled it down. Uh, I couldn't, uh, for some reason, find a picture of that, but this is the more type uh, where you actually engaged it. And of course, uh, if you remember back, uh, you, you sit on this uh, seat cushion, and the seat cushion, uh, uh, like on the 27 and other aircraft, uh, didn't have, were not over water. They did have, not have life vests uh, at the time. And uh, so you were told to use the seat cushion for flotation. Now, this is where somebody would learn the difference between open cell foam and closed cell foam. For flotation, you want closed cell foam. An open cell foam is called a sponge, and that absorbs water, and that would take you right down. Okay, so if you had to go down in the water, you're clinging on to the seat cushion that people have um, used for numerous, uh, you know, setting on. Uh, we called it the fart cushion. Uh, <laughs> And you were going to have to uh, sit there and hold on to this thing. Yeah, not not very uh, nicely thought of. 
course, on the left is your typical aerobatic harness there, and it's a double harness, and uh, so you got two la uh, locking lap belts there. This is your typical uh, six point, uh, seven point harness in this case. Uh, you got the. This is what I have in my uh, Great Lakes. You got the shoulder straps, the lap belts. And of course, on the right is what we have as pilots in the front of the airliners. We've got the uh, the restraint system there, the lap belts to keep uh, the shoulder harness to keep you from going forward, the lap belts to keep you down, and then the uh, crotch strap there from keeping you from submarining, which is uh, you would actually go under the lap belt, and that's not good. But but one thing I'd like to comment here, uh, you know, the flight attendants will get up there and they'll tell you how to use this thing. They'll tell you how, you know, to put it in there and how to click it. They're demonstrating, as required by federal law, they have to demonstrate how to use a seatbelt. Well, my feeling is, if you have to be told how to use a seatbelt like this, if this thing pops out of the overhead ceiling, you are in grave, grave trouble. You're never going to be able to handle this thing if you can't handle a seatbelt. And, of course, we have the lap belt extensions here. Now, um, I, at one time... Uh, early in my aviation career, I was rather skinny and um, I would come out of the cockpit and I would put one of these lap belt extensions on. I could put it all the way around my body and, and snap it. And I would tell the flight attendants that I could walk around now with my seat belt fastened because there it was fastened around my body. Yeah, they thought that was kind of funny. Well, that worked for a while and then it, 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 it didn't work. Now, interestingly enough, there was another misbelief uh, that seat belts were killing passengers uh, during a crash on a commercial airliner. On October 31st, 1950, I was about two months old here, uh, 28 out of 30 passengers uh, died. They were on a Vickers VC-1, and uh, a Dr. Donald Terrier uh, conducted the autopsies and he reported uh, in the British Medical Journal that the immediate cause of death in more than half of the victims was acute flexion of the body over the safety belt. Uh, the article went viral and this was, uh, you know, there was an internet or that, so I'm not sure how fast or how it exactly went viral, but uh, it, it went viral uh, back in the day and uh, it was scaring people from using uh, their safety belts. And a Dr. Eugene Dubois, the former chair of the Committee on Aviation, refuted the claim uh, in his article in the uh, British Medical Journal, uh, concluding that the cause of the death of the crash uh, was that the passengers were thrown against hard objects. But uh, people at the time, okay, this is back in 1950, they were also very skeptical about uh, seat belts in cars. And, and of course, seat belts in cars didn't become mandatory till much, much later. It wasn't until 1971 uh, that uh, seat belts were required uh, to be on aircraft and they were required to be fastened during takeoff and landing. Um, and it's the responsibility of the pilot in command to ensure that all people aboard the aircraft have been notified to fasten their seatbelt. Now, one thing I used to say as captain is, is, you know, what what I'm doing when I tell you to fasten your seatbelt is to a certain extent, I am transferring liability from the airline to you because I told you to strap in. And, and one thing that amazes me on flights, um, I know seatbelts are uncomfortable, but if you're just sitting in the seat, keep the thing strapped because we're moving you know, forward at about 800 feet every second. And it doesn't take much of disturbance to throw you. And people are killed on international flights when we hit turbulence. Now, we, you know, it's clear air turbulence because it's in the clear air and we don't see it. And it can be sudden. And people are thrown out of their seats. They hit the overhead panels and they're killed. Uh, you know, keep your seat belt fastened when you're sitting in your seat. It couldn't be more simple than that. Uh, otherwise, you know, I mean, the poor flight attendants, they obviously don't have much choice and they can often be in injured. But anyway, seat belts are a crucial point in aviation safety and keeping passengers safe. And it's amazing how long it took for it to be widespread and still certain people ignore it to this day. So, would you fly one of these airplanes without being strapped in? You know, you hit some turbulence and you can be a goner. And of course, I love this photograph. 
these two people are getting a ride, and there's the pilot starting uh, the engine. Now, of course, once he starts it, he's going to go around. Uh, I'm not sure if he can go under very well, because look at all those extra little wires and stuff. But he's going to start uh, start the engine, and then come around and get in. So I hope the aircraft is either tied down reasonably well, or one of these two passengers who probably don't even have controls back there knows how to fly this airplane. Very, very interesting situation. But anyway, that is a little discussion about early seatbelt implementation and use. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Thanks for watching.